Good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, today's session of Grad Chat. Um, uh, today's session is uh, dedicated to discussing uh, graduate researchers and some of the support and policies that are around uh, graduate researchers at the University of Melbourne, and we'll be able to facilitate some questions later. Um, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that we, we're meeting on uh, the land of the traditional custodians. Um, and I would like to pay my respects to the elders um, there in the past, present and emerging uh, here. So um, I'm actually joined by uh, t two very special uh, guests, especially, and also we also have our, our fa families officer with us. So I'll just start the introductions. Now, we're very lucky to have um, the University of Melbourne's Pro Vice Chancellor of Graduate International Research. Um, who is responsible for the leadership and oversight of policy, strategy, and implementation of research training programs and international research relationships. Now, that's, of course, our professor, Justin Zobel, uh, who's also a, prof uh, a professor of school in the School of Computing and Information Systems. Um, he has research interests in search technology, algorithms, and bioinformatics. A graduate of the university, uh, of Melbourne. He has a distinguished career as a researcher and academic leader. Development of strong graduate researchers has been a focus throughout his career, particularly through his teaching of research methods and communication skills. And he's an author of three texts on research methods and research writing. So uh, thank you so much for joining us, Professor um, Justin Zobel. Um, and we're also joined by um, our very own Dr. Natasha Abrahams, now, Natasha is our senior um, policy coordinator here at GSA. Uh, she works within the representation team um, on GSA's advocacy efforts. She has recently completed her, uh, completed her PhD in sociology at Monash Uni and um, has been involved in local and national student representation during her time as a graduate researcher. Um, thank you, Natasha, for joining us. And also, um, we also have our families officer. So Lubna uh, is on the call as well to uh, support um, students, graduate students with families, um, and is your representative um, through GSA to, to voice your concerns or, or look for support is definitely to go through the Lubna Mepata. So uh, welcome everybody to this session. Um, I want I might take this chance is to um, Invite Lubna. Lubna, do you have any any questions or comments to 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 put forward to Justin while we're here? Hi, Justin. Uh, yeah, I have a, a, a small question. Uh, this is uh, coming from my personal experience, so uh, I feel like uh, we generally we have to ask excuses like a lot like you know we may miss the conf opportunity for conference or meeting and all this because mm -hmm. of our parental responsibilities so uh I, I i was always reluctant to ask i don't know how the uh, supervisors feel around the situation or is there is a general consensus that it's like uh, students with parental responsibility like that it's it's expected from there from them so something like that so how how to approach this kind of situation especially especially around this covid we are like constraints have increased so how to go about that so how to be like really open to supervisors and yeah around our situations um so to, to repeat your question so that yeah. to be sure that i've understood it um, yeah. you, you're making the point that people with parenting responsibilities can often struggle to uh, fully participate in the international or even national academic yeah. community. Yes. And um, how can or should the supervisors help with that? Uh, th that's, um, again, uh, you know, a, a universal issue. And it's been fantastic to see a shift in our university's culture for academics I'll get to graduate researchers in a minute, in the last few years uh, with explicit funding, um, for example, for extra childcare for academics who wish to go to a conference, recognising that for some academics, um, they would not be able to attend without that financial support. And I would, different faculties have, different schools have different uh, models for, 
funding of academic travel for their graduate researchers. There's no uh, university setting for that, but I'm aware that a number of schools do indeed attempt to assist with additional support. But it is, it is a, ch a challenging situation. Um, absolutely, I, there is no one size fits all, in, in part because those care responsibilities are so challenging. In a way, the COVID crisis, if it brings a benefit, I, I wonder if it will help people in that category because it will be, I imagine from now on, much more common to be participating in conferences remotely, allowing people to, to participate while still being at home. Yeah, I agree with the conference perspective there. So normally for every conference, the networking events would be like in the evening. So that obviously, mm -hmm. yeah, we miss most of that part. So now since it, everyone is re remote, so yeah, that's, that's, a part, that's a benefit for me, I felt for that case, actually, yeah. I think th th thanks, Lubna. Look, um, we're still waiting for Natasha to jump on the call, but um, we do have a question, and I don't know if it's even possible to answer this one right now, um, Justin. That um, one of the attendees is asking whether you know it looks like that the COVID leave um, is being interrupted by different faculties uh, and differently. Um, do you know why? And is is there some some backlog? Or I mean, is, are you probably don't even know the answer? But I thought we just will address the question if we can. Yes. No. I, I think I can give at least a partial answer, and I think that's a great question. Um, uh, so let me begin by admitting to our imperfections as an institution. <laughs> um, typically, when we want to do something new, create a new degree, a new category of leave, a new category of employment, um, a new status, we spend a year as an institution talking through what that should be, testing it by hearing the arguments for and against, and then we spend a year implementing it and making it available. We've done in the last five weeks, two years of work, trying to get things like COVID leave up and other mechanisms up for other cat classes of student like the hardship funds and so on and so forth. And one thing that that five weeks has missed out is what we call the socialization, namely that opportunity to go out to the faculties talk through what the mechanisms involve, talk through what's expected, talk through what's normal and what's abnormal, and just make sure there's a common and shared understanding across the institution, uh, which is 8,000 staff in you know, a couple of hundred buildings and all, all of the difficulties that presents. So I, I'm unsurprised that it's being interpreted differently. We are, as I said, meeting weekly talking through things like the different COVID leave applications. Uh, I'm, uh, people in my team are reviewing the applications that are approved and the ones that uh, are in just to ensure that we're being as consistent as we can, but it will take time for that norm to, to be widely recognized. Um, but of course, if anyone believes that they've been treated uh, inequitably, then I'd encourage them to make that very clear to their faculty. And I would imagine that um, we, we, we all recognize that we're struggling to take on new mechanisms uh, as quickly as, is, as they are needed. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for answering that one, Justin. Look, um, we'll come back to the question around children because I know that, um, oh, actually, uh, speak of the, the devil here. We have Natasha who's literally just jumped on. So I'm going to hope that her, her mic is working well and I'm going to invite her to, to complete what we're, we're talking about uh, parenting um, and sort of the re graduate researchers and their child, uh, child caring responsibilities at the moment. Natasha, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Perfectly. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we've heard from graduate researchers who have increased child caring responsibilities. Um, perhaps their child's been sent home from childcare or this, their school is closed and they have to homeschool. Yep. And they're not sure if the current um, COVID-19 leave provisions for graduate researchers are applicable for their circumstances. So would you be able to clarify, um, are they able to access that COVID-19 leave and what else might be available to people in that situation? Um, sure, thank you. Um, how long is a piece of string? It, it would be part of my answer. 
I, I would say to anyone who feels that they can't yet mix up homeschooling with study to take a short block of COVID leave um, while they assess for themselves uh, that whether they can study or not. So yes, they can access it. If they really, if they, they've reached a stage where they're confident that they just can't do justice to their study. But my advice to people is to access it for a short time and reassess and see how their restructuring of their home life goes, you know, the extent to which their partner is able to support their study regime, the extent to which their children adapt to being self-directed in homeschooling. It's gonna be different for a six-year-old to a nine-year-old to a 12-year-old. So I don't want to say anything sweeping. Um, I can imagine what it, um, certain 12-year-olds would be very, very challenging. Certain 12-year-olds will just sit in front of the thing and do it all day. And then I would encourage people who can study a bit, as I said earlier in, in, in the conversation, to do that study. And the reason I say that is that my very long experience as a supervisor, I've um, supervised around 50 candidates um, over the last 30 years, is that people who take a proper break often struggle to re-engage. It's easier to keep your, your um, intellectual understanding of the problem, your depth of understanding of what you're working on, active and vital and alive if you engage a little bit every day or every week, if you completely drop it for two, two months, say, it can be very hard. It can take quite a long time to get back into that groove of understanding and you know, remembering everything that one was doing. And it's, it's, a, it's a, a cliche, but it's true. A, P, a PhD, I am talking about PhDs in particular here, is the most complex piece of work most people will ever do. And it has hundreds of moving parts that slot into each other in complicated ways. And keeping that fresh in your mind is so important. So from a study point of view, it's valuable to stay engaged from a sense of well-being. If you set yourself a target of 10 hours a week and you can hit it, that's a great feeling that you, you know, you've been able to do a little bit. And for those people, yes, they can access the leave, but maybe it's better to rely on reporting that there's been an interruption later on and managing that as an extension later on. Okay. Fantastic. Natasha, did you have anything else to, to add to, to this? Um, no, I think um, that's really helpful for graduate researchers who are in that position and we're seeking a little bit of clarity. Yeah. And again, um, if I could add, the key thing is not to really not to assume that the university is going to, uh, let me state that positively. The university is not going to come back in the future and set and impose, impose harsh requirements on people who have been affected by COVID. That's just not going to happen. We understand that people's lives have been, um, uh, let, let's say, um, uh, interfered with all the way to disrupted all the way to completely turned upside down in all sorts of ways. We're not going to try and judge for people that they um, tell people down the track that nothing happened. We're going to help them complete their PhD and just don't be anxious. Do your work, do the work you can do and set yourself realistic goals and people should be comfortable um, doing a bit in these situations. Right. Look, that, that, thanks, Justin. Um, yeah, it, it definitely it's, it's, it's a, a situation where I guess no one really planned for. And I guess we're all trying to do the best we can in, in all on all levels. Um, now, we had a, this a, this a follow up question or uh, on a comment that you made about uh, inequity of response for the leave applications. I mean, if there are any other channels that you suggest if if it's not if they can't appeal through faculty? Um. I'm surprised to hear that people can't appear through fac appeal through faculty. So it, it, I've got a two part response to that question. Um, the first part is that they, there are all the usual grievance procedures and they are procedures and procedures 
um, are a pain in the current situation. You know, it's difficult to make contact with it, to sit in the same room as your head of school and all of the usual people you'd raise things with. Mm. Um, I would, uh, we are, so we understand on the one hand that our, some of our existing processes still work in inverted commas, but are perhaps a bit more challenging and in themselves imply stress. And the last thing I want is for people to get stressed. Um, so I do, I, my experience of the associate deans for graduate research is that they are as a body all open and receptive and understanding. And I have been encouraging them to raise difficult issues with me. So my first piece of advice is if you think you've been treated inequitably, write to your associate dean for graduate research or to your faculty graduate research contact and they're listed on the university website somewhere prominent that I don't have it open in front of me. And if you're not satisfied with that response, you can escalate to my office. Um, I, um, I say that slightly tentatively because it's a busy office and I don't can't promise to get to everything on the day that it comes to me. Um, but if you're really not satisfied, then that is an avenue that's available to you. Great. Look, th thanks, Justin. Um, uh, now I'm going to sort of move on to our next theme here is, is, is based around extensions. So um, we've had, been hearing a lot from graduate researchers whose research progress has been paused or, or slowed for various reasons. Um, and uh, such as, you know, field work was cancelled, uh, lack of lab access, lack of access to resources, and high levels of stress and anxiety due to current circumstances. I mean, I'm, I, might, I might throw this to, to Natasha first um, and just see what, what sort of stuff um, G GSA has been advocating for. Yeah, um, so at GSA, um, we've heard from a lot of graduate researchers um, who they might be experiencing a variety of different circumstances, but the common element is they just need, or they think they'll need a bit of extra time. So we've been pushing for three month extensions for all graduate researchers, um, and that that should be in addition to current extension provisions, which students might have been accessing anyway due to a variety of different circumstances. Um, so we understand, um, Justin, that you're currently working on developing a policy and um, determining the level of support that um, the university can provide to graduate researchers in terms of extensions. So could you tell us a bit more about the decision making process and when we can expect to hear an announcement on what um, that policy might be? Sure. So you, um, I'll first of all confirm that you are correct that we are working through the policy options and that may, uh, apologies for the bureaucratic, um, slightly bureaucratic response there, but I'll reiterate that period about five weeks and understanding the impact on everybody. Um, we are hoping that within the next few weeks, we'll have a fairly full understanding of what the picture of impact looks like. And Tavita mentioned a number of kinds of impact, and I can certainly add to those. Um, mm. There are student graduate researchers at the VCA who, uh, whose work is um, difficult to wrap up because the exhibition venues are closed. Um, there are people who um, have experiments booked at major research facilities you know, where the booking was made a year ago and they're not likely to get that booking again <laughs> because, you know, mm. if you're booking into a large hadron collider or something, that's going to be hyper precious time with this, that's competed for globally. Um, not to mention, of course, all the people who've had the uh, very difficult personal interruptions we've already been talking about. Um, and it's because of those sorts of factors that I, I'm, uh, myself not in favour of a single uniform extension to all candidates. I, I, many, many candidates will need that three months and it will be available to them. There are many candidates who will need a lot more than three months. And I need to make sure that we have enough capacity for the people who need the six months and for the people who need the nine to make sure we can support everybody to the amount that they need. And I, what I would say is around timelines, um, 
I need first of all, and we're gathering that data from the whole graduate research cohort by the supervisors, understanding what the total amount of delay is across the whole institution, and then trying to set up the simplest possible mechanisms that are lower stress, easy to access, where candidates can test the amount of extension they need and get that amount of extension. And again, it comes back to the, the point I was making earlier. I think it comes back to that point, but please do um, contradict me, Natasha, if you think I've got this wrong, is that the principle we want to pursue is that everyone gets their PhD. And we know that's going to involve extensions and we just have to be generous with them when they're required. And in a sense, the precise mechanism isn't the critical thing. It's the guarantee that if they're needed and justified that they will be provided and the justification should not be a stringent one. It should not be a challenging test that people have to meet. It should be a straightforward test. This has happened. It's in this category of event. They're going to get that extension. Yeah, fantastic, um, Justin. Thanks for, I mean, stating that clearly. I think the fact that, you know, that it is, it is in the spirit of, you know, of, of doing the PhD is that the university wants everyone to complete their PhD. And um, looking at mechanisms to allow that is, is something that's, I think, reassuring to, to an extent. But I guess what, there's a lot of work to still do in the, in the background. Um, yeah. And that's, again, I'm asking people, you know, again, I've had a number of people say, I know I need a six month extension. And I've, some of those I've spoken to, they're going to, I think six months is a really good guess, mm. or maybe it's not even quite enough. Um, and other people are, just, are to some extent reporting anxiety because they're detached from their peer group. And even if they're back in the lab, say at the end of May, which is a possibility, I don't think it's all that likely personally, that's just a personal guess. Um, then they all have been looking at three months. Uh, there are a small group of candidates who was working pretty much as they did before. So it, it's um, understanding that picture properly is really important. But again, as you say, that principle, peop, we want people to get those PhDs and we want them not to be anxious now. So I do ask that people to some extent wait and be assured that it will happen but we all need to understand what will happen in the world to make good judgments. There are some things we won't know for a long time. I don't know when people can resume their field work in Africa or India or Indonesia or South America or East Asia. None of us know that, but it's very hard to make judgments for those people today because we have no knowledge as a society of when that level of restriction for international movement will change. Mm. Yeah, true, true. Um, I guess that leads, we've got another question coming through, but actually um, ties in nicely with the next theme about the um, potential bureaucratic, uh, bureaucratic issues that, are, that students are facing um, in applying for the support or, um, or accessing the support. So, um, you know, it's, it's something, some of the university support measures have been in place for quite a few weeks now. Uh, we're starting to hear from students that they're experiencing, experiencing issues in accessing it. Um, and that came from uh, a comment from, from the attendees there about, um, you know, being able to, to apply for, for certain leaves and, and how it's, they, they understand that it's great that uh, people want to finish their PhDs, but they also feel like um, as an RHD student, they, they need to be supported without, you know, compromising both quality and the mental health of, of these students. So, uh, um, Natasha, did you have anything to, to add to, to this potentially, uh, this issue, this theme? Yeah, um, so just to provide a little bit of context, um, GSA since kind of the beginning of, of when this started about um, over a month ago, um, we'd been campaigning for financial hardship um, funds and supports um, for students, including um, funds for students to be able to set up study spaces if they need to, if they don't have that at home already. And the university has implemented such a program. So that's a really fantastic development. Um, so since that has gone live, we've heard from a couple of students um, who are struggling to fill in the forms to access that financial support. So 
for example, um, if they don't have a printer and a scanner, um, they'd be unable to return the signed forms. Um, and this is, of course, coming at a time when students are um, feeling a high level of stress and anxiety. So um, these bureaucratic tasks are more difficult right now than they might usually be. So what alternatives and support is available for students in this type of situation? Um, I, I'm going to admit that I'm kind of stunned to hear that in 2020 we have forms that require a printed signature. Um, so perhaps if you could, my answer to that question would be, I, I was unaware that that was the case. If you have instances, please provide them to me and I will get them investigated and resolved because we should not be requiring people to print and scan in order to access anything. Oh, great. Um, I might, yeah, seek a little bit more information on that and get back to you um, about Please the do. specifics of those Please instances. Please do. I guess it's one of these these things. It's it's such a, a moving moving beast to the university is that um, things like this do prop up, and without proper communication or being informed, it's hard to know uh, where the pain points are for students. So, That's right. um, so yeah, th th thanks for um, for bringing that up, Natasha, and um, and also just thanks for so basically saying, look, let bring it to your attention because it doesn't it does not sound right. Um, now, look, uh, we've got some, uh, I mean, we've got a couple of minutes, probably about 15 minutes left of the session to, uh, of Justin's time to, to take some questions. Um, we have some questions that were pushed to us earlier, um, but happy to, to field some questions from the group if, if anybody would like to, to put forward. Um, while, you're, while you're deciding if, if there's a question you'd like answered, I'm, I've got another one here, um, uh, another one here. Natasha, did you want to go through any, any questions at all? Um, there's just a, a couple of smaller questions um, that have come up from um, what we've heard from students. So one is if graduate researchers who are on stipends can access the university's emergency support fund. Um, so we've heard a bit of conflicting information um, from different people who work at the university um, on this matter. So we'd really appreciate um, a definite answer either way. Um, so I'm going to admit that I'm um, to one, uh, on one dimension of that, seeking clarity myself. Um, but the short answer is that a student who is in Australia and is on a stipend has so far been ruled not eligible for the hardship fund or the financial support fund on the assumption yep. that those candidates are already getting an income from the university. And indeed, there may be, um, there are, can be challenges for us procedurally in terms of providing extra money, but that has, that's been the ruling. I yep. believe in some hardship cases, faculties have, have ad hoc provided support. There are, however, a good number of candidates who are stuck overseas. These are typically third country individuals. These are people who are, say, um, a, um, let me let me make this up. A Bhutanese individual who was at attending a conference in Chile and finds himself um, unable to return to Australia because of the um, uh, restrictions on travel by non by people who don't have a, a permanent visa or a or a, a citizen. Um, and such people we have been providing the hardship fund to and also additional travel support in some cases. Yeah, okay. And it, it's, it's, it's interesting because that actually is one of the questions that I, that I have here is that um, we've been told that you know, we understand there are difficulties with extending international student courses due to visa issues. Yes, um, correct. Yeah, so can you explain more about uh, what the university is doing to sort of mitigate this issue at all? Um, the university can directly uh, I, the university's ability to influence the um, Department of Immigration is um, fairly small, I have to say. Um, you know, we are one amongst many hundreds of organisations in Australia that uh, uh, would, that depend on visa processing mm. and depend on the visa processing laws. And of course, we seek to influence them where we can, but we're one amongst many. Uh, what, is, what is particularly challenging at the moment is that because of the international travel restriction, 
they, the government has decided to stop issuing new international study visas. Okay. So somebody who's on a study visa that is expiring has been formally advised, we've, the formal advice we've received is that those candidates should um, apply for a visitor visa and that the Department of Immigration understands that that is happening and is issuing those visitor visas. So that's a far from ideal situation from anyone's point of view. I would, um, it's never been possible to my understanding to extend a student visa. You, one can get a new student visa um, if one has an existing one, but it formally in legal terms, it's not an extension. So it's, it's not a great position, but we have been offered that compromise solution of a visitor visa for people who are already here. And obviously we're lobbying hard for a more satisfactory solution. Okay. Thank you. Um, we've just got a, another a question here from, from the group. Um, can you confirm for us whether or not the university is coordinating with Australian universities in response to the HDR, HDR candidates? Um, there are been conflicting re reports within HDR networks about differences in supports uh, being provided by different universities. I guess the concern is this obviously is, is around inequity um, and there's also risks of impacting the quality of University of Melbourne research by comparison. Yeah, um, so there, there are inconsistencies between the universities. We, we uh, um, uh, speak to our peer universities all the time mm. in a very collaborative way, I might add. It's um, surprisingly collaborative given the, the fact that we are in some senses in competition with each other. Sure. But there are inconsistencies there have been and some of these have been reported in the press, so I'm not sort of declaring anything secret. For example, in the level of restriction of access to facilities, that's been a little bit variable because that's another impact, of course, whether a candidate can get to a library or, or get into their lab. Um, as for the visa extensions, sorry, the stipend extensions and candidature extensions, the G08 have been reasonably consistent. There have been some small differences in how they are communicated, um, but the, the level of, we've all essentially committed to the same level of uh, extension in fact, although the ways that the mechanisms for accessing them might be slightly different. So the other universities do not have a hardship fund of the scale that we have, and they haven't got an equivalent to the COVID leave, but some of them have um, offered um, for late candidates, for example, a relatively easy access to extension where the work has been stopped. So they're kind of giving the same benefit, but in, in somewhat different terms. And they reflect also the different structures of the university. Melbourne is um, particularly dominated by the lab disciplines compared to the other GO8, for example. So the mechanisms that we look at are somewhat different for that reason. I, I noticed there was another question that went by, by the way, um, from Stephanie, I believe it was, around um, placing the responsibility on people who are in powerless positions. And uh, I would, would say back to the group, one of my greatest um, concerns as a pro vice chancellor is that of course there is a power inequity between supervisors and their candidates. And as a university, it is absolutely incumbent on us to ensure that that in all circumstances, that that power imbalance is redressed by the right mitigations and my mitigations that are actually effective. I'm, uh, at the same time, it is always the case that when people apply for leave or sick leave or whatever, that that is a request made by an individual of the organisation, just as it is for a staff member. So my response there is that the appeals processes and the support structures, whether it's the Safer Communities Program or the Graduate Research Administrators or the sort of direct line into the academic board by the heads of school, 
via deputy deans, those mechanisms are there to redress balance. Uh, and there is zero tolerance for any supervisor or administrative part of the university that abuses that power imbalance. Zero tolerance. I don't want graduate researchers to be placed in a position where reasonable demands are being treated as if they were unreasonable. And I would um, be gravely concerned were that occurring. So I can only say in reassurance that we know that that is an issue, that the power imbalance is, is inevitable. It's inevitable in an employer-employee relationship, in a manage, managed relationship, in a junior senior relationship, but we seek to institute every possible mechanism to ensure that that imbalance is not abused. If there are issues, I want to hear about them. Right, look, thank, thanks for addressing that question, Justin. I think it's really important um, to make that comment is that there is zero uh, tolerance for this um, sort of um, behavior. But um, I've got another question. Um, I've got a, actually, I've got a final question. We've only got a few minutes left. So I know that you, you've got to jump off the call soon. So um, if I can, just just a, a general one here is that some students have been uh, found that they're unsure how to find out about being eligible for leave. Uh, do you know where, where we could find that information or we could direct those students? Um, first of all, there is an FAQ. It's slightly hidden um, at the moment. Um, and I will post the link into the chat box as we speak. Um, as I had that um, question put to me, um, but the, the local graduate research manager, either within the school or within the faculty, and um, there's a list of faculty contacts somewhere that I don't have open, um, but it's very easily found on the website, um, is the correct point of first contact. We're, we're talking with the graduate research managers every day, and they should be very informed and be able to give the right advice if the FAQ doesn't go far enough. And also, if there are problems with the FAQ, we're fixing that every day too, as, as the situation evolves. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Um, Natasha, did you have any um, comments or final words with, for, for Professor Justin? Um, I think this has been really helpful, especially um, seeing the types of inquiries we're receiving from students right now, um, and more just around um, the anxiety that they're feeling about not knowing if they'll be able to get that lever extension that they need. Um, so it is really good to have that reassurance, which we can pass on to the students. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Um, and just before, uh, Lubna, did you have anything you wanted to put forward or say, say at this time? No, I'm good. It was a really great uh, session, uh, very informative uh, for me. And I hope other uh, attendees uh, are happy with that too. I don't have any specific question at the moment. Great. Thank you. Right, look, Justin, um, I won't take any more time. I just want to, on behalf of GSA and um, our, our cohort, we'd like to thank you so much for taking the time this morning. Um, it's been really informative. Um, I know that um, some of the questions that you're asking from the students seem to um, get, get some good uh, responses and we'll, we will try harder to get more uh, information from the students so we can present it to the university um, about what's going on uh, with our cohort. So well, th thank you very much, Tavita. And um, perhaps again to reassure your audience, um, there is an open channel from the GSA to my office. I've um, spoken to you several, to the GSA several times recently, and uh, we are listening to every issue. I just want your, every graduate researcher out there to be reassured that we take the concerns seriously, we change every setting that we need to where we can, and um, we listen. We listen with people believe there has been injustice or inequity. Fantastic. Yeah, again, Justin, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Natasha. Thanks, Luba. And thank you to everyone who was on the call today. Um, we'll be releasing this uh, tomorrow. We'll just clean it up a bit and put it up on the on the website for everyone to access. If you, um, and you can share it with your, your fellow colleagues or friends to see uh, if they missed the session. So again, everyone, have a great day um, and we'll see you next time.